Um, yeah, over the years, anybody that's re been researching as long as I have, you collect evidence. Um, I've received uh, information from people for all kinds of different things. Most of the time, if I get hair, it is usually hog hair, horse hair, deer, something of that nature. I've never, I personally have never received actual hair that could possibly be Bigfoot. A uh, lot of footprints, uh, handprints. My favorite investigation was back in Florida, back in 2001, at the reclamation plant, water reclamation plant um, in the St. John's River Management area. Uh, they had a lot of activity going on there. Um, I was c contacted by Thomas Steenberg, who had been contacted by Debbie, the witness. Um, because I lived in, down, down there, he contacted me, and I went out there and investigations as far as sightings, um, vocalizations, their chickens got killed um, that they had penned up for West Nile virus studies, and fingerprints, uh, handprints, they had full glass pane windows on the reception area, and they had received uh, I had received, rather, a phone call from Debbie saying, hey, we've got these handprints on the window that happened when this thing was looking in the window one night. So I went out and there, collected the evidence. Um, always remember, uh, evidence collection is, has to be done forensically. Gloves, uh, have paper bags handy or paper envelopes handy. Uh, tweezers, good camera, something to use when you're taking pictures to uh, used for scale. My pictures um, were the handprints, and in some cases you could actually see the hair where it pressed against the window. Um, the handprint isn't the full hand. It was looking in the window, so it was kind of like had bent fingers, but I got good palm and thumbs and the tips of the fingers. In some cases, it wasn't just the, I mean, it was like he moved his hands. Okay, or he leaned against the window so you could see the hair impressions on the window. Um, I've got, this is my favorite. This is obviously skin with hair um, impressions on it. This, the imp the handprints and the imprints I received, uh, a lot of oil in them when I looked at them. I did swab them for, uh, you can see it in the pictures. It's the dew on the windows, but a lot of oil in, in both the handprints and in the impressions from when it leaned its arm against the window uh, in the hair. So um, I did swab these, very important. Use fresh swabs, whether they be um, ones you can buy at the, the drugstore for swabbing the nose and things like that, because they're already packaged and you, you know, open them up using your gloves on your hands. You swab an area and it goes back in its little container and then you can seal it again and then it can be sent off for DNA analysis. Um, I swabbed them. I sent those off to Todd Disitel. Unfortunately, it was too degraded to get any DNA off of it. Uh, took tons of pictures and then I um, dusted the handprints and pulled those off the window and sent those to Jimmy Chilcutt. Unfortunately, because sun and glass don't mix when you've got something on it heats up real good the uh, DNA was degraded too much the handprints didn't have quite enough detail where he could actually pull prints and and analyze them in his computer um, so either way they were great uh, experience they were very De this is Debbie who was my uh, witness she's pointing to way up here where the handprints were and basically the handprints were roughly eight feet because it moved around and everything. But um, it was funny because she worked graveyard. She came in from the back warehouse of the, the shop into the reception area, and there it was looking at the computer screen, watching the windows little logo thingy going on it. This is back in 2001. Um, but that's what it had it at the window. And then when she walked in and saw it, and it saw her movement, then it kind of stood up and then took off. But she had very, a lot of activity in that 
one little water reclamation plant. It was in, it was out in the wildlife area. Uh, not anybody can get in there. You have to have the key card to get into the gate. To and it was only for workers. Who, like should punch me in when I came in there. Uh, weird sounds at night. The big huge door uh, lids that were on the. Uh, what do you call them? They're the, the where the sewage water was held, um, being lifted up and dropped. Um, just she'd drive in one night and see a female run behind her car as she's coming in the long, long driveway to get to the plant. Uh, interesting, interesting area. Um, she's retired now. No telling if there's anything still going on out there. Uh, but it's extremely important when you are going out to any area that there's going to be, that there was activity and you're going to check with a witness, get their story. Uh, you always have to be prepared. Make sure that you've got a go bag, meaning a backpack or something that's got um, a microphone and a TAS cam in it. And, and I say microphone because I like to use that hooked up to um, any kind of sound system because it, it it brings it in better. You don't want to just rely on the Tascam or you know that their microphone because it doesn't pick everything up. You want gloves. You want tweezers cleaned and bagged after you know being clean with alcohol. You want um, plaster or dental stone or something to make casts. Pre pre arranged beforehand is better if you've already got pre measured into a Ziploc gallon bag then all you do is hand you know put water in it and mush it up and then you've got something for your tracks um measuring tape pencil or pen with notepad so you can take notes um i'm trying to think through everything uh, i always have my cameras my night vision night vision cameras if you can see that of course, you've always got your game cams you want to put out there. Um, FLIR. Most of the, the little stuff is in my our backpacks, so they're ready to go. And then the bigger stuff, like I always take extra, again, at dental stone, hydrocal, plaster, if that's all I've got at the time. Keep that in my car all the time with a bucket for um, pla uh, making the casts, whether they're hand prints or um, footprints. Footprints are the most common evidence that we find. Um, it's great if we find many footprints in, you know, in a trackway. Uh, the, this one here, 16 inches, we got that. Uh, this is from New York, upstate New York. Okay, and alongside that, we found these, a smaller one. So the, these were done with just plaster pairs, nothing special, because they were done a long time ago. Um, uh, I, hydrocal is my favorite form of media because it, it sets up quicker and it doesn't generate as much heat. Uh, so uh, I like the sprinkle method. <laughs> uh, you don't want to just take it and just dump it into the trap because you're going to distort any fine prints or dermal ridges that are possibly there. You don't ever want to take out uh, twigs or anything. I don't. I prefer just having it natural just the way it was. Uh, and then you just do splatter, you take hands and splatter it gently into it to make a very thin, small, you know, just, it's, you don't want to mess up anything. So it's going to be gentle. You just kind of splatter it in there. That way it adheres to the original without so much weight. And then you can gently pour from heel forward with the rest of your hydrocal or whatever media you're using. That's usually the best way. If they're large tracks, and I'm talking really, really big tracks, anything bigger than 16 inches, I would use um, some kind of a, you know, hiking, you know, a tent sticks, the aluminum ones, to place in there just to give it a little f more firmness so it's not gonna break as easy. Because the bigger you get, the more fragile it's going to be where it, doesn't, it doesn't, won't take much to break it. So put some stability in there with something like that. If I'm collecting any kind of DNA sample, whether it's the oil or something like that, or blood, if I ever find one, I've never found blood, and I don't know anybody that has. Um, my go-to guy for DNA is Todd Disitel. Uh, basically, I get what I have, I put it in a paper bag, I put it in a paper envelope. 
he already knows it's coming, and I'll try to overnight it to him. Um, that, the fastest way I can get it to him. From there, it's on him. He's got all his procedures that he does. Hopefully he finds something. Uh, as of yet, I haven't found anything that's worthy of, you know, anything. But, yeah, Todd Distel would be is my go-to guy for DNA. Uh, Jimmy Chilcutt used to be, but I haven't talked to Jimmy in a long time. He used to do um, fingerprint and palm print, you know, prints from the great apes, gorillas, chimps, orangs, and studied them as far as Bigfoot would be concerned um, to see if there was a difference between a Bigfoot's fingerprints, swirls, and whatever versus uh, a gorilla or a human. So, but yeah. They're, they're my go-to guys for stuff like that. It's, it's, it's not common to find stuff out when you're investigating something. You, like I said, most things you're going to get are footprints. And those would, you would send to usually um, Dr. Meldrum or uh, Cliff Berkman. Uh, they're the ones I would send stuff to as far as footprints and analyzing the footprints. Uh, we always have go-to people. Any vocalizations that you might have on tape, I would send to uh, Chris Spencer and, or David Ellis uh, with the Olympic Project. Um, yeah, I've got my favorites that I use because they're credible and they know what the heck they're doing, and they're not going to just take something and say, ooh, this is a, you know, a Bigfoot scream. No, they're going to analyze things, and they're going to see what range it's in so that we know, hey, it's a coyote. Coyotes make some really good sounds that people have mistaken for uh, Bigfoot howls or Bigfoot yipes or screams or whatever. But, yeah, always make sure you've got to go to people. That way you know if you find something, you can get it off to them right away, and they can start analyzing it. Scientific Total method. scientific method is the most important thing, and, yes, because they do uh, use scientific method, and a uh, collection of any evidence has to be forensically. Don't get your spit or your hand you know, oils from your own hand on anything. That's why it's important to have gloves, masks, um, and, and all your equipment needs to be cleaned. Tweezers, scissors, anything like that that's going to be touching it, make sure you clean it each time with alcohol and then put it in an, a bag so it's sealed and clean for the next time around. If we get a phone call and somebody calls and say, I just saw a Bigfoot, it's, it, it, hopefully they will get us information at that time as quickly as possible so we know where the, the location is. I mean, it, it, it's a simple process. We grab our stuff, get in the truck, we go. We get out there. The first thing we want to do is talk to the witness. What did you see? When did it happen? Uh, what were your uh, feelings, reactions, emotions? Um, you know, we'll take note of the time of the day, season, you know, things like that. And then we'll start analyzing whatever they, they have to show us. A lot of times it's just they have a sighting, and so all we can do then is just walk around, try to walk a grid, and see if we can find any, any footprints or anything like that. That's, that's not quite as easy. Because um, a lot of times, like we had a sighting a couple, couple months ago, three, four months ago, sorry, um, and they saw it run across the road. The, all we can, the main thing with stuff like that is you want to just make sure you get the environmental data because there weren't any footprints. Um, he didn't get any uh, video or pictures, as of course, because that's usually the case when you've got something running across the road. So the main is, is getting data as far as, you know, environmentally, where it was, time of day, which direction, season, things like that, because that always helps when... If, it, if, you, if you want to call it a database type thing, to be able to pinpoint where you can go to uh, research an area, um, at least gives us an idea what time of the year, moon phase, when it's more likely to hear something, see something. Not, I mean, it helps. It's just like the you know, needle in a haystack type thing, though. They were actually heading to um, Detroit Lake, uh, going 224 route, and they came around a curve and saw it coming from the river and across the road and um, of an, you know, a very steep embankment. Uh, so they got to Detroit Lake. He called us. 
and we met him out there. Um, so it was about an hour and a half, hour, hour and a half after he actually saw it where we, he was able to get to us, and then we took off out there. And so it was about an hour later than that. So, But, I mean, that's extremely <laughs> awesome to be able to get to a sighting area within, you know, two and a half hours of it happening. Unfortunately, there were no footprints. Um, I think, and, and in case like that, witnesses do tend to forget exactly where they cross the road. So you tend to have to walk way up and down the road to try to see if maybe you see some footprints, gouges in the, you know, embankment or something. Um, we didn't find anything, but, you know, he, I have no reason to doubt the man, him, him seeing something cross, huge cross the road in front of him because it came from the river because the road run right along the river at that spot. And so they came up and across the road and way, and then up the embankment. So, and things like that happen more times than anything where you don't really have any physical evidence, but at least you've got the witness and you can get the environmental data for it, anything like 224 is the Bigfoot Highway. So my favorite area to, to research is all along the uh, Clackamas River drainage, 224, Fish Creek, um, up uh, the high mountain lakes up there, Shell Rock. Um, yeah, that's Roaring River drainage. Uh, it's perfect, beautiful, awesome. A lot of activity all over from, yeah, everywhere. It's perfect. Because he's uh, been researching Bigfoot as, you know, he, he's, he likes to go to conferences and things like that. Really nice guy. Uh, he was excited, extremely excited because he saw something he never thought he'd ever see. And at first he thought, no, nah, that's not what I saw. Um, but he, said, but he, was, he was extremely, he wasn't scared. His girlfriend was scared. That's why he couldn't stop. And she said, take me to the lake and then you can come back if you want. She was scared. Um, he was excited. And you get that whole range with, with most witnesses. Some are, not many. <laughs> Some are just blase. Yeah, okay, I saw it. Uh, others are, are extremely frightened. Some are leery because they are more concerned about the reaction they'll get from other people if they hear about their sighting. Some are um, happy, some are in shock, some are excited. It, 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 it's the whole range of emotions. Um, a, a lot of them are, and, and anybody that's done research for as long as we have knows this, that you start hearing stories from, you know, just talking to somebody in a restaurant and then, oh yeah, my brother so-and-so, so you talk to that person. And it, word of mouth is where you get most of your information on, on sightings and witnesses. Um, and uh, the, the main concern that people have is other people's reaction. Uh, they're just gonna think I'm crazy. Or um, th just things like that. They're, they're more worried about other people's reaction to their story and that's why a lot of people, of course, don't talk about it. <sighs> Between new moon and half moon, you get more sightings. It's, and you have, to, you have to think of it in the way of um, other animals as well. You're not gonna see as many deer out at night if there's a full moon because they, they can be seen. And in other cases, it's the opposite on certain, with certain animals. Um, yeah, new moon to half moon. Most cases with with moon phase, um, and still you get a lot of the the summer, fall sightings more, but then again, could it be because less people are out in the woods in the winter time, and there's less people to see something? A lot of that takes into consideration. My favorite time to go out is in the fall, and uh, usually most activity is between. 11 o'clock at night to 2 in the morning and then dawn, right before dawn and after. Because they move around at night doesn't necessarily mean they're nocturnal. It just could be that that's how they hunt for food. Um, yeah, they're seen all the time out during the day as well. So <laughs> uh, and yeah, there's no way to tell until we can actually study them and hopefully one day that'll happen. I have found, and this is speaking from 
researching in Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, Alabama, portions of Mississippi, Louisiana. And then out here in mainly Oregon, but some up in Washington. Um, I find that every, it's all the same. Uh, hair color, skin color, height, weight, they all vary. Um, their, the way they, they, they may be seen more at night or more during the day, it's, it's all the same, I've found. So patterns are the same wherever you go that I have found in the areas that I have researched. So the south, southeast, and northwest. I have seen no difference in any kind of patterns. It's all the same as far as I've seen. The behavior of the Bigfoot when they're, be, when they're witnessed by someone, I, I don't think there's any difference between regions. I think we're talking more of they're all individuals just like you, we are. You're going to have grumpy ones, happy ones, sad ones, fun ones, grouchy, you know. So I think it's more of a personality difference between different individuals than regions. Um, yeah, they're all different shapes and sizes and colors, just like we have different hair colors. They're red, brown, black, white, gray. I think the chances are the ones that are white or gray or elderly ones, older ones, or you could just have ones that have, you know, women get white streaks of, you know, hair in their black hair. It, you know, it, it, it's, it's not some kind of anomaly, I don't think. It's just uh, individual variants in hair color. But Bigfoot's intelligent. That's what helps their being elusive. They're, they're, they're not a herd of elk. They're not a pot of whales. They're hominids that are intelligent and know how to, be, you know, they don't want to be seen. They're not going to be seen. Most instances are accidental when uh, we have witness sightings. Um, the, that's right there. You've got, you know, all this area, even just here um, in North, you know, Pacific Northwest. If they don't want to be found, they're not going to be found. They're smart enough to be able to figure that out. They don't want to be seen, and they're not going to be seen. And it's 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 like me going out in the woods and deciding, I don't want to have anybody bother me anymore, and I can make sure that I'm not going to be seen by anybody. It's it's the intelligence of their of of Bigfoot that helps them stay elusive. When, if it's discovered, described, shown as a new species, and so close to man, you're, you're going to have a wide variety of, of emotional and psychological differences between people. You've got the religious ones that are going to say, okay, it's this, and they're going to figure out how they want to see it. Science is going to see it this way. Other people are going to see it a different way because you've got something that is so close to us, it's going to scare some people. It's going to frazzle them. Uh, good God knows what the governments are going to do uh, because once it's discovered and described and it is scientifically proven that it's there, then you've got protection. And some governments aren't going to want to do that. They don't want to have to spend their money to protect a huge, because we're talking huge areas of land. So are you going, and then the timber companies, it's gonna be such a <laughs> huge reaction, different ones. Um, because this thing is gonna be a hominid. It's gonna be homo whatever. Um, it's different than a gorilla or a chimp or uh, anything like that because they're their own species. Bigfoot is going to be part of our genus. And that's going to, it's going to scare some people. It's going to excite other people. I'm going to be excited. Um, it's going to worry people. And it's going to, it's, I don't think anybody can predict really how it's going to happen. Reactive measures 
because there's everybody's different, and you know between people, religious organizations, and the government, and you're going to have different reactions. And I don't think anybody can really predict what's going to happen. It's going to be a free for all. It's going to be a little unnerving, probably. Um, be, hopefully, the government won't react like they usually do to anything because they usually tend to overreact. But uh, it'll be interesting. I'm just going to be glad because we'll be able to get more funding. Researchers will be able to get more funding because once science has proven that, yes, they are there. We have the proof, and we have named it this. Funding will be easier to get. Then we'll be able to learn more about them. It's still going to be di difficult because you're still talking about intelligent individuals that move, okay, that don't really want to be found. They're not our friends, okay? You know, there might be, you know, lots of them out there that are going to have personalities just like we do. You don't know what one you're going to encounter if you do want encounter one. You don't know what, you know, if they've had a bad day or a good day. So it, there's so much up in the air. But I'm, I'm looking forward to it because we'll be more equipped to be able to find out more information about them when it's been, once it's been discovered and named, cataloged, everything. So ideally, well, ideally that, that we study them but leave them alone, uh, that would be the ideal mine. Uh, I don't want to see uh, tons of people out in the woods trying to shoot them, kill them, and look what I got, and I'm going to mount it on my wall or in my corner. Um, I, I don't want to see that happen. I want protection. That's what you know. American primate conservatives is about is being able to um, protect and learn about them. And so protecting would be great. It's, it, my concern of course is people going out there trying to kill them. Um, Cause once it's been discovered, it's, it's pretty much gonna be a free for all for a lot of people. And until the governments and state and you know, local get, get something on the books to prevent that from happening. Some kind of laws that say you can't kill them. If you do, you're hitting jail or something, some kind of, you know, something to limit them from harming them. Um, yeah, I, I, I think they know more than they laid on, and I think it's more towards um, protecting the humans. Um, and in some sense, you know, it's uh, what they don't know, they won't, it won't hurt them. You know, the government's always had that kind of a mentality. I, I think they know that more than we do. Um, I don't think they want to put money into it. As far as they're concerned, you know, it's something out there and it's not going to, as long as they don't show it attention, it's not going to affect the economic portion of government and states and cities because that's their main concern. Not as much science. It's how it's going to affect the economy of their particular area. Because um, you, it's you know, if if it's proven, then they're going to have to provide laws and protection, and we all know what happens, you know, when the environment and the government clash. It's not a pretty sight, but that it's going to happen. Uh, I I I don't think they just they know it's there, but they don't really want to worry about putting resources into proving it because then that's going to open up a whole another can of worms for them. Um, I don't think it's a, you know, oh, we can't have them finding out. I don't think they're worried about stuff like that. No, not like with UFOs. Um, UFOs, you know, we've got something that's coming from another planet that's really a lot, a lot, lot smarter than us. And But with Bigfoot, I think it's more of a, um, yeah, you know, back burner, you know, don't push it. Because then when it happens, it's really going to be a, a big deal and they're going to have to put money out. And they don't like doing that. So, how can we be better people knowing that Bigfoot exists? Um, I really don't think it's going to matter. I know that sounds bad, but um, everyday people are concerned about paying their bills, raising their kids, things like that. Bigfoot's going to be really cool if you know when it's discovered. I don't think it's going to affect people to change themselves. I really don't. It's, it, it's going to be cool for a minute, 
and then it's going to be oh okay they exist because it's not it it's not going to affect their main concerns in life which is you know family paying the bills you know those in the military country th you know things like that. it's not going to have a huge effect on them because of that i know it's sad but you know I don't think that's going to make a difference after the initial brouhaha to people. It's going to be something cool, and that's then it's going to be it. It's mm -hmm. human nature. Basically, hoaxing is an attention-getting thing. They, they they've they're hoaxing for the first time because they want attention. Uh, or you've got somebody that had a sighting and loved that attention and wants to bring it back, so then they start hoaxing. Or they just keep hoaxing and hoaxing and hoaxing just to, you know, for the attention or money. That, that's, that's hoaxing. They want the attention and they want the money. If they, if they can get money off of it, great, but they love the adoration. Look at me. Oh, I'm my special. That, they love that. And they, a lot of them, they keep doing it because they, they have to have that fix. And it's sad. But, yeah, I, I hate hoaxers can't stand them it, it's always going to be there and they're going to continue to do it and they're going to continue to get money and or praise by people that's how they continue going because it's always going to be somebody out there is going to believe them we're trying to get people to understand this scientifically what they are the only way to get funding is for people to take it seriously to take Bigfoot research seriously. They're not gonna keep taking it seriously. They're not gonna take it seriously, and i.e. not donate money to search for it if you've got all these clowns out there doing this. And it, it brings the bar a lot lower. People don't take it quite as seriously. And therefore that makes it harder for us to get funding and to get credibility for anything that we find. Misidentifications, you got people out there that they'll see something, it's a Bigfoot. No, it was a rock, it was a tree, it was a this, it was a that. Uh, and, and a lot of people you get when they see something and they'll take a quick picture and then they'll leave because they're so scared. And I'm like, so did you go back there and is it still there? Oh, I'm too scared to go back. And you go back there and it's still there because it's a rock or a tree or something. Um, most, of the, uh, most of the time it's a misidentification because people do want to see something cool. They want to see Bigfoot. You know, and they're out in the woods and they see something and they say it's Bigfoot. And I can tell their friends, I saw Bigfoot, when it really wasn't Bigfoot. So, doesn't help either. <laughs>